So good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce Haluk uh, Senken. This is the last NCG seminar. I don't know, it's the last one on the book. So I was just looking at the webpage. Uh, the last one from North America for the semester, for sure. And stay tuned for further uh, updates. But uh, in the meantime, um, welcome Haluk, uh, who will speak on local theta correspondence via sister algebras of groups. Right, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Haluk, and I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, recent work of mine with Bram Mestland. And before I start, I'd like to thank Nigel and the other organ organizers for this uh, invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, right, um, this, this is a kind of uh, intersection of uh, C-star algebras with, with representation theory, that kind of area. And I know that the NCG world is quite big so not everyone is interested in that intersection but i'm hoping that this is going to be kind of more an interesting type of representation theory in the sense that we'll be seeing about some heisenberg representations and some uh, double commutation theorem so it's kind of uh, familiar to the ncg crowd um right so yes yeah, joint work with bram from leiden and uh, yeah so i'll talk about local theta correspondence um it's actually a I see Professor Rosenberg here. So this, uh, perhaps the closest it comes, I guess, I think um, the Heisenberg module construction of uh, Riffle comes close to it in the sense of, you know, uses the Schwartz function with Heisenberg uh, uh, representation. But I've seen, I think the only place I've seen from the NCG world is a survey paper of Professor Rosenberg where I was talking about theta correspondence actually. Um, so yeah, so there is, there is not too far. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that uh, from a perspective that I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be maybe a familiar uh, or more amenable to you, this crowd. And then I'll talk about the um, C star algebraic interpretation. It's a more of a kind of a uh, refill equivalence by module approach to it. And hopefully, if time remains, maybe indicate uh, one or two applications. It's going to be representation theoretic application, but uh, yeah. Right. So. Um, Okay, so let's set the scene. Um, I'm gonna start with a local field, F, characteristic zero. So we're thinking of uh, maybe Archimedean ones like reals or the complexes, or maybe some non-Archimedean one, uh, finite extension of QP. You can be more general, uh, I, I won't, but uh, yeah, you could also consider finite fields, positive characteristic as well. And um, so we're going to take a symplectic vector space, over this field W with the uh, so this this uh, form is uh, so we, it's equipped so it's a finite dimensional uh, vector space over F equipped with this uh, form that's non-degenerate skew symmetric or anti-symmetric if you will uh, symmetric and bilinear right and. Um, so that we have the symplectic vector space and we're going to consider the Heisenberg group which is, uh, so you take uh, W and add a component uh, made of F and uh, put to, introduce the rule, multiplication rule that's written as here. So you just add the W components, but when it comes to the T component, you, you twist it with this, uh, this uh, here, uh, term here. So as you see, I'm dividing by two. So usually a uh, positive characteristic. Uh, so the, yeah, so there is a division by two here, but we are, it's, in characteristic zero, all is good. So this Heisenberg group is, of course, is very well known. And uh, center is the uh, this extra component here, zero T. Uh, it's isomorphic to F. It's a new potent group. It's very well studied. And um, we're going to look at its uh, representation theories. Of course, it's classical. It's the Stone von Neumann theorem says that if you fix a non-trivial character, uh, chi of, of, of F, the base field F, then um, up to Aquinas, there is a unique irreducible unitary representation of, of the Heisenberg group with the uh, important feature that the center of character is given by chi, that chi, fi the fixed character chi. And so there is a unique, uh, there is a single uh, Aquinas class um, with the central fixed center of character, non-trivial. Of course, when the character is trivial, of course, you, you basically descend to a representation of W, so it's, it's abelian, so you get only one dimensional representations. So if to get something interesting, you need non-trivial character. And 
this so this Ekulis class, I guess, is collectively is called Heisenberg representation. But of course, there are lots of different models. It's a Ekulis class, and um, that makes it quite versatile, choosing different models. And and I guess the most famous model is the Schrödinger model. So as I have a symplectic space, I can do a polarization, complete polarization, meaning that I I can pick up two uh, subspaces U U star that are totally isotropic, meaning that the my my form uh, is zero when I restrict to these uh, subspaces. And in fact, using using the form, I can identify these two subspaces as each other's dual. So that's why this notation, I guess, is suggestive U U star. Anyways, once I have, and of course, this is even dimensional necessarily, symplectic. So these are going to be of maximal dimensions. So I guess sometimes people call these Lagrangians. But anyway, so once we have a composition polarization like this, the Schrodinger model uh, works like uh, acts on the L2 space on this on this uh, Lagrangian U. And the formulas, I guess, are most familiar. Uh, if you take an element of the U component, it acts as translation. So this is the U operator. And then we have the, the V unitary that's the coming from the U star part that acts kind of like a dilation thing. Um, you pair the input X with U star and then act with your character on it. And, and these two, of course, give you a projective representation of U, uh, sorry, W, uh, a projective representation known as the Heisenberg representation that is, I guess, well known from uh, Riefel's Heisenberg module construction and so on. Um, uh, but to get a true representation, to lift this to a true representation, we have to go to the Heisenberg group of uh, W. So the, finally, the F component, the, the F extra component, acts simply through the character uh, as this, that's the central character pi part. And yeah, so these are the famous, uh, I guess, formulas for the uh, Heisenberg uh, representation. And of course, it's also important to note that I guess the smooth vectors of this representation can be identified with the Schwartz uh, functions uh, on, on U. Right, okay, so this is, I'm guessing is quite well known to everyone in the audience, probably has known this all much better than I do. And uh, so to get to the theta correspondence, we're gonna jump to the automorphism group. So we're gonna kind of go one step higher. Um, so we're going to look at automorphisms of the Heisenberg group that fix the center. Um, they come essentially from the symplectic group associated to W, uh, the, the GL uh, invertible uh, linear maps on W that preserve the form. And when you have such an uh, automorphism, you can post compose with the Heisenberg representation and get another reversible representation. So it's uh, if you take an automorphism, symplectic automorphism G, rho twist by G, uh, is simply you act on the W component so that the center is fixed. So that when I do this uh, post composition with the automorphism, I get an irreducible unitary representation, but with the same central character because the center was fixed. So therefore, it's equivalent, entirely equivalent to the uh, original row. All these twists actually don't. So if you think of this as an action on the dual, unitary dual, this row is fixed. And therefore, there is an operator, inter operator MG, uh, such that when I conjugate rho uh, with the adjoint action, uh, it gives me my twist, uh, twisted version. And by Schur's lemma, so this this uh, inter operator is uh, up to scalar, up to scalars is unique um, by Schur's lemma. So therefore, we have a kind of a mapping that takes my symplectic. Oops, where is my? Ah, there it is. My symplectic automorphism G goes to the class up to you know unique scaling of the operator interoperator mg and so that gives me a projective unitary representation of the symplectic group so i kind of pull the situation heisenberg back to the automorphism group and this is called it has several many names um oscillator representation so i subscribe to roger house school of uh, looking at things here so this oscillator representation but also known as way representation or uh shale where represented maybe i have the next slide is where i should discuss this and a slight note here uh the heisenberg representation of course was very sensitive to the character um here the sensitivity is very mild by varying the character i have only finite many possibilities uh so there is uh, very little uh, sensitivity uh, to the 
central character that I started with here. But anyway, so I have a projective unitary representation of the automorphic symplectic uh, automorphisms of W. Now, of course, we're gonna we want to pull that to a true representation. So this is a result of I guess going back to Ziegel and his student Shea uh, from a physics perspective, working over the reals, and then Andre Way coming around almost the same time actually from a number theoretic point of view. He wanted to so these these vectors in the Schwartz space they give rise to these theta functions, well-known famous theta functions of Jacobi and Ziegel. And, and Andreve wants to approach that from a representation theoretic point of view. So he did it quite generally, um, also with the you know, Piadic and Adelicly, so um, beyond the reals, Archimedean case. But anyway, so um, is the attribution is to these three people. There is a double cover. Uh, Called the metaplectic cover, uh, central double cover of the symplectic group, uh, to which the, the oscillator representation leaves the true representation, uh, not a projective one anymore. Um, so it turns out that the if you look at the projective representation, it's of course corresponds to a two co-cycle. The two co-cycle has order two, so it, it, you don't have to go to a whole uh, uh, infinite C star extension. So yeah, so yeah, double cover is enough. Um, and uh, of course, this double cover is not a linear group, um, so it doesn't have any finite dimensional representations. And what is really special about the oscillator representation is that it's it's, a, it's the smallest representation of this metaplectic group. Uh, small, um, they call these things minimal representations. There is different ways of um, making this notion rigorous through Gelfan Krilov dimensions or through um, you know um, maybe thinking about the coadjoint orbits and stuff like the orbit theory. Uh, but yeah, I, we don't need to go into it. But the idea is that uh, it's it's among all the genuine representations of the metaplectic group. This is the smallest. It's still, of course, it's an infinite dimensional representation, but it's small as it could be, and that's going to be important for the uh, story. Right. Okay. So um, although I have to introduce the metaplectic group, I'm really going to forget about it because um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that. I won't really work with the metaplectic group directly. So the Idea now this we go to uh theta correspondence or known as how duality Roger how um so we're going to introduce uh this notion of a dual pair uh so we're going to talk uh, so the definition goes like this uh, a pair of subgroups g h uh of the symplectic group of w we call this pair a dual pair or maybe a reductive dual pair, if they're reductive groups, uh, or more concretely, if the action as their automorphisms of W, so their actions are completely reducible, um, so that every invariant subspace has an invariant complement. So, but yeah, so this is just, it says G and H are reductive groups. And, but the key point is that they are each other's centralizers. So they commute, but also to kind of, you want to push that to the maximal, uh, and the example, I guess, okay, the most famous example of such a pair uh, is the so-called orthosymplectic pair. Um, so what you do is, so this is a symplectic group and an orthogonal group. So you have the symplectic group, uh, uh, the automorph symplectic automorphisms, isometries of a symplectic space, uh, V prime, let's say with the uh, form uh, with a dash here. And here V is an orthogonal space. So it's a symmetric bilinear, uh, non-degenerate symmetric bilinear not the other one is Q-symmetric. So if you have two such finite dimensional uh, spaces over F, uh, you can simply take their tensor product and equip this guy, the tensor product, with the simply the product of the two forms. Because one is symmetric, the other is Q-symmetric, the product is again Q-symmetric, so you have a symplectic, this tensor product is a, a symplectic space. And obviously these two groups embed in there, and the fact, I guess, is that uh, they are each other centralizers in there. So this is the most famous example, but of course there are other examples. And actually, Roger Howe uh, classified all the possibilities of such G and H sitting inside a symplectic group. There are you could also uh, cook up. My pen is acting up. You could also cook up unitary pairs. Both groups are unitary, so you have a skew Hermitian and Hermitian. Uh, uh, but you could also boost it up to if you work over maybe division algebras. You can also get quaternionic versions of uh, these these kind of groups. They are less popular. And then there's even, uh, if you take these forms that I, the, 
not uh, degenerate like to zero forget about the forms just take vect the vector spaces then you can have a uh, gln glm so these are called the type two pairs simply linear groups two linear groups these are uh, usually known as type two they're also perhaps less uh popular from an automorphic forms point of view which is where i come from uh, but anyway so there are other versions of other types of uh these are all the other types of um dual groups but I guess for this talk, um, I'd like to, to just think about this most classical one, the symplectic. One of them is symplectic group, the other one's an orthogonal group. And it's enough to think about this that gives you a lot of very interesting uh, cases anyways. Right, so okay, what do we do with this GNH? Why are we uh, focusing on that? So okay, so um, before I go, what we're gonna do is that we're going to basically, uh, we're gonna do a branching problem type of thing. We're gonna take this oscillator representation, which is, an infinite dimension representation, but it's small for the metaplectic group. Uh, here, the, I'm working with the metaplectic group of, of, of the symplectic space given by this tensor product of these two guys. I guess this is my big W. I should have maybe stick to W here. But anyways, um, uh, of course, there is this slight problem that um, my GH sits inside the symplectic group and the, the metaplectic one is a double cover. So we need to look at the inverse images in GNH, pull them to in the metaplectic cover, but it turns out that uh, this is a very complicated technical work of Kudla. For almost all uh, dual pairs, you can find a splitting, this dotted arrow, uh, that makes this whole comp triangle commutative so that I can simply pull back the oscillator representation, the true representation of the metaplectic group, back to this G, G cross H. Yeah, so this is some unitary representations in some model. So I can pull it back to G, G cross H. And um, the only obstruct, uh, the only exception is this, uh, where you have a symplectic group and the other one is an orthogonal group, but the dimension of the orthogonal space is odd. This is the only uh, exception where you cannot really pull it back to G cross H. What you can, you, the orthogonal group splits, but the symplectic guy doesn't really split. So you need to take the metaplectic cover of the, symplectic group in this case when dimension of the orthogonal space is odd that's the only exceptional situation um so there is a little but but, but you can't forget about that i mean it's, it's a minor uh issue it's actually an important uh case you know this metaplectic you know you there's the whole shimura correspondence sets up things between the metaplectic group and SL2. So it's half integral modular forms are really related to a metaplectic group. So it's important that we have the metaplectic group appearing as one of the dual pairs, but uh, we don't really have to care about it for the purpose of the talk. I'm, I'm more interested in the general mechanisms of how things work, so we don't really have to worry about that. But anyway, so um, I'm going to view the oscillator representation as a representation of this uh, G cross H sitting inside uh, the symplectic group. And so it's a kind of a branching problem. This, this uh, G cross H is much smaller than the, the ambient symplectic group. And I'm taking this small representation of the metaplectic group to this uh, smaller group. So that it's gonna look quite big, but not terribly big. That's, I guess, very important for, for what we want to achieve. So perhaps to give a flavor, um, so it's a theorem of uh, Roger Howe. Um, so we, we insisted that they form each other centralizers, but it turns out that actually something more stronger is true. Um, so if you look at the, so I'm right now I'm viewing the oscillator representation as a representation of G cross H. It's a unitary representation on some Hilbert space in some fixed model, whatever. And um, so we look at the images of G and H in the, C star algebra of bounded operators on H, and they generate each other's commutants. Um, that's a Roger Howe showed this for in the case of real when F, F is real, and in some other cases in general. I don't know if there's a full proof for all the cases, but um, but it's yeah. So it's it's more of a yeah. So it's this is a fact, and it's obviously stronger than the assumption that they are centralized of each other in in the group, and it. In a sense, this is the essence, I guess, and this is kind of a familiar uh, situation for the NCG uh, uh, audience. And uh, I guess one of the most important examples of such double commutation thing is, you know, you think about G uh, acting on L2G with the 
from the left and from the right, left and right regular representation, and they, they generate each other's commutants. And um, so what you can do then, if you know, if you look at the L2G as, as a bi-regular representation of the, um, I mean, I want to see G cross G as not a single group, as, as two groups, uh, G and G, uh, two copies of G acting in a commuting way on L2G. So if I view this uh, L2G as a representation of G cross G, of course, I, I can uh, decompose it's a type, let's say we are a type one group, and I have this decomposition, well-known decomposition. And of course, the groups, the, the measure here is the Palancharel measure, so only tempered guys appear here. But what is important, I guess, is that pi enters with multiplicity one and, and with together with pi star. So I have uh, something like a, a pi and pi star are matching as they enter together uh, the by regular representation. So this is the kind of flavor that we'll, we'll, we'll go after with the oscillator representation using G and H with the commuting. They generate each other commutants. And um, so that's what we kind of want to do and get a, some kind of a, of, a, of a correspondence between the representations of G and H that they enter the oscillator representation. Perhaps uh, the, as Roger Howe amply promotes and digs into it very deep. So this, the roots of this goes back to classical invariant theory. The spherical harmonics is, I guess, the most important situation classical. So I'm going to look at the, uh, let's say we are in the uh, real case, F is real, and my G is the um, uh, SP, W, W is R squared. So it's, it's two dimensional. So that's SL2R in other words. And here I want to take uh, uh, V, uh, I guess, R to the 2P. So I want ev um, even dimensional orthogonal space uh, with positive definite uh, uh, inner product so that the orthogonal uh, isometries of this will be the orthogonal group compact of, of degree 2P. So I want, I, I didn't want to put odd here because if I put an odd degree here, I would have to consider a metaplectic group on the left hand side. I just want to stick to SL2, although it, it of course works in bigger, yeah, with the metaplectic group as well. But anyways, so if you have this, uh, there is a well-known decomposition um, of the, um, so I, I can view this as a, so this is this is the oscillator representation essentially, uh, basically. Uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm going to, take the Schrodinger model of the oscillator representation. So um, I'm going to take, uh, I mean, maybe I should have stressed it. Uh, the oscillator representation acts on the same Hilbert space as the Heisenberg representation, because I'm jumping from Heisenberg. Uh, so if I take the Schrodinger model for the Heisenberg representation, so I'm basically, this is my W, right? This is my W and my V is R to the 2P. So, uh, so this, this is my V prime, I guess, sorry, this is my V. So this is my big symplectic space W. And I can take a polarization of the symplectic two-dimensional space as R plus R. And uh, if I now uh, distribute that, I get R tensor R to the 2P plus R tensor R to the 2P. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, so this is essentially R to the 2P plus R to the 2P. Uh, so this is my U, U star, the complete polarization. So I can, so in other words, uh, the using the Schrodinger model of the Heisenberg representation and jumping to the oscillator from that one, my oscillator representation for G cross H is realized on L2 space of R to the 2P. And actually the, the good thing about working with SL2 here is that it's you know it, the it's two dimensional so that the Lagrangians are one dimensional so I can simply put the orthogonal space uh, v here and h x naturally the orthogonal group simply x naturally here the representation of g is a slightly more complicated um, but anyway so this is a g cross h representation and because h is compact it has a very simple uh, direct uh, sum not a direct integral but a direct sum discrete uh, decomposition. And the pieces are, so the H representations uh, are the so-called spherical harmonics, and the SL2R representations are the discrete, holomorphic discrete series. So just to remind you, the spherical harmonics uh, are certain, certain, they are the irreducible representations of O2P, uh, or compact orthogonal group, coming from uh, homogeneous polynomials of degree N, so the N goes from zero to infinity, 
the number of variables is fixed by the uh, the space I'm working with, and the harmonicity. So they are killed by the uh, spherical. Um, oh, sorry, this is the um, spherical uh, Lap Laplacian. Um, this guy, or is the two maybe on this side? Yeah, sorry. The orthogonal group commutes with the Laplacian, so it it uh, respects the uh, eigenspace of the Laplacian and. So these guys give you irreducible representations of, of, of the orthogonal group and the decomposition. So there is the, the P is, so this is P here, not it's half of the two P. That's a little important detail, but the matching is like this. So the nth degree, uh, degree and harmonic polynomials are matched with uh, lowest weight with weight N plus P uh, discrete series, holomorphic discrete series. So we have this, uh, because it's a discrete sum, we have a very clear bijection between uh, certain uh, the holomorphic discrete series of SL2R on the other hand side and, and some harmonic ones, uh, the harmonics, spherical harmonics of the orthogonal group. In general, of course, these are not everything on each either side. As we can see, it's clear for the SL2R, it's just holomorphic ones. The anti-holomorphic ones are not there. The other There are other unitaries, of course, complementary series, principal series are not there. And for the orthogonal group in general, these are not everything as well. But some parts of these unitary duals are matched um, and in, in a bijection there. So this is the flavor. Uh, this is that the how duality greatly generalizes. So here, let me give you the uh, formal statement. And uh, as you see, it's it's more sophisticated in the sense that we want to go beyond unitary representations to the whole admissible category. Um, that's where the uh, grown-ups uh, play that's, uh, in, in representation theory. And also, we're going to not look at sub-representations, but quotients, uh, which turns out to be, I guess, uh, more flexible. Um, that's what experts say. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, It turns out to work better to work with quotients. So but because I want to work with... Okay, first, maybe I shouldn't rush. I, I guess I, I think a lot of the audience knows a lot of representation theory, but let me just remind you that admissible category, so we, it's a kind of a finiteness condition that makes the category quite algebraic, uh, op, um, amenable to algebraic methods. Um, for example, if F is Archimedean, uh, we want to say that pi is uh, uh, admissible if, if when you restrict it to maximal compact, it's unitary, maximal compact is K here in the Archimedean, K. and and, the multiplicity spaces are finite dimensional. For any sigma in k hat, unitary dual of k, uh, you want the multiplicity space of sigma in the representation pi to be finite. So it's a finiteness condition. And I guess admissible, irreducible in the finite, in Archimedean case, this is equivalent to the category of GK modules. And in the non Archimedean case, um, it's known that. If admissible is smoothness plus some kind of finiteness uh, uh, condition, but uh, irreducible admissibles are known to be just equivalent to being smooth. And the smoothness means open uh, stabilizers. Uh, stabilizers of uh, points uh, are open, open subgroups. Uh, right. So, but uh, yeah, so it, again, it's a kind of a finiteness, but it makes it quite algebraic so that this category of admissible. Uh, representations in the in the non-Archimedean case then is uh, uh, equivalent to Heck algebra modules, uh, category of Heck algebra modules. Just like in the Archimedean case, it was a GK module, so this is Heck algebra module. So it's a much bigger category that contains the unitary representations, in particular the tempered ones. Uh, but I, as I understand, I'm no expert in this, but the, as I understand the the uh, the gain by going to this bigger category is that then that you have the longest parameter, you can parameterize the whole place. And then uh, the game becomes, can you detect unitarity in this big garden kind of uh, games? But anyway, so we're going to be in admissible category. And to get admissible thing, uh, so we go beyond unitary, uh, we're going to work with the smooth uh, subspace of the unitary representation. We're going to, and, and typically remember from the, uh, Schrodinger model, the smooth vectors are given by the Schwartz functions. So we'll be thinking about the oscillator representation of G cross H uh, 
I'm I'm putting an infinity here to stress. I guess we're not working with the unitary guy, but uh, so endomorphisms of uh, the some kind of short space like this. Right. Okay. So the rule, uh, the how duality. Finally, the definition works like this: the formal definition. Um, you we're going to look at if you let's say you have a uh, irreducible of uh, G and then C and then pi and then irreducible of H. Uh, for, forgive my H as I got used to this English pronunciation here. Um, right. So these we're going to say that two elements from the G side and the H side they are in correspondence with each other. If there is a non-trivial intertwiner from the smooth oscillator representation onto pi tensor sigma, so it's a quotient of the smooth oscillator representation. And in the Archimedean case, you insist that the kernel is closed, so there's some topological also details there. But yeah, so this is this is the idea. And so we, as I said, we're working with uh, quotients uh, that technically works better. And uh, so the this rule, we. Uh, the, the claim was the Hobb conjecture, and then it's been proven by, I'm going to mention some names. This rule sets up actually bijection between a subset of the left-hand side and a subset of the right-hand side. And these subsets are, I guess, technically, you have forced to, So these are the uh, representations that enter the os oscillator represent. They are quotients of the smooth oscillator representation on each side. So if you're a quotient of oscillator representation, uh, then you're gonna be matched by a unique guy on the right hand side. Uh, that's that's the that's the claim. That was the conjecture of uh, Roger Howe uh, in the mid seventies. I guess he was in actually visiting Max Planck for the year, and he came up with this. Um, and uh, he proved the Archimedean case himself. And then um, Waltz Perger, based on some important results of Kudla, did the Piaget case with p not equal to two. Alberto Minguez did uh, the, I guess, type two, completed the type two cases and gun, VTEC gun, um, using some ideas from Minguez's proof, uh, completed the remaining cases of last project with the P equals two, and also did the quaternion case later with, with Sun. But I'm sure there are other names that I should be mentioned, but yes, I'm not expert in this. Right, so as you see, this is a quite an abstract recipe. Um, and of course, the the, representation theorists are interested in, okay, so which, can we determine what these sets are? Um, can you describe them? How do you describe? I don't know, maybe using the long parameters. And and also, can you tell me what goes to what? Um, once you know which guys have entered the correspondence, can you also describe them in some way, some meaningful way? So those are the most important, I guess, questions representation theorists really uh, pursued, but, but I'll be interested in the kind of general mechanisms, of course, and using C-star algebras, and of course, with the uh, refill induction and then the uh, equivalence bimodule techniques. And of course, then I'll be forced to stick to unitary representations as I'm using C star algebra. So, in general, unitarity is not preserved. So, we're going from admissible guys to admissible guys. So, it turns out that there are two cases that stand out uh, in this representation. They stand out in the sense that they have this bijection requires some nice features. So, one is the so-called stable range case. This is the case where, roughly speaking, one of the groups is at least twice as big as the other one. So there is a big, uh, what's the opposite of symmetry? Is, is, yeah, so they're anti-symmetric or something. Yeah, so this situation is far, far from symmetric. And in terms, I mean, of course, the, the I guess, uh, the precise formulation of this would be that, you know, both groups are isometric groups of some sort. And uh, you insist that one of these vector spaces has a totally isotropic subspace whose dimension is at least equal to the other one. So that's the uh, that's the formal definition. But anyways, we, we can stick to our favorite uh, dual pair, symplectic orthogonal pair. So if, for example, if you want the symplectic group to be the big one, you just have to, because symplectic group you know, always has this complete polarization, you just have to say that the dimension of the symplectic space V prime should be at least twice the dimension of the orthogonal one, for example. This is a very easy criteria. You can go the other way as well. If you, for example, F is real, sorry, if you take the real ones and, and you want the orthogonal group to be the bigger one, then you have to say that the width rank of this guy is the 
uh, smallest dimension of the total isotropica is the minimum of PQ. You want the minimum of PQ to be. Uh, so if you take this pair and you want the orthogonal one to be the bigger one, then you want to say that uh, this is P and Q are at least as big as 2N. Um, I get that right, something like that. Maybe I think. Uh, yeah, I think it's at, at least the size of the other one. Yes. Right. So what happens in this case is that when one is much twice as big as the other one, unitarity is preserved. So this is a well-known result. I guess going back to first investigations was again of, as usual back to goes to Roger Howe. A uh, student, uh, Jian Shu Li of uh, Roger Howe, really uh, finished this case and completely proved that unitarity is preserved. And moreover. The whole unitary dual of the small group, let's say H is small here, I didn't say, uh, say H is small. The whole unitary dual embeds into the unitary dual of the big guy. And the other case of uh, remarkable other cases, when the two groups, like the other extreme, have essentially equal size. And the... I guess the most important well-known case of this is that if you again go back to a symplectic orthogonal pair, uh, of course the symplectic group is always even dimensional. Uh, if this is uh, so, you want the or, sorry, this is the orthogonal one. The orth you want the orthogonal one to be uh, dimension of the orthogonal space to be one more than the uh, uh, the symplectic one. And as so this this forces the dimension of the orthogonal space to be odd. So we are really working with the metaplectic group on one side and the orthogonal group on the other side. But uh, let's not worry about that. And the unitary version of this, for example, the both unitary uh, the Hermitian spaces would have the same dimension. But what what's important here is that uh, the temperedness is preserved in this case. Uh, this, I guess, Shimura correspondence is the most famous example of this, the metaplectic cover of SL2R, MP, uh, R2, and O21 uh, is the famous example, going back to Shimura and then Shintani and Niva and Valsperger did a very representation theoretic uh, study of this case and whatnot. And actually, even more things are true. Discrete representations go to discrete representations and a lot of interesting things are preserved like uh, formal degrees of discrete series are preserved a lot of interesting things happen in the equal rank case and finally it's been 40 minutes it's not too bad i guess um now i can talk about uh the result and please jump in if you have questions or comments um so um, I guess we, we have results both in the equal rank, these, these two cases, equal rank and stable range cases. And uh, so what we are saying is that there is actually a C-star correspondence that captures the bijection when you, of course, uh, restrict to the tempered parts. So let's say we are in the equal rank case. So you have, um, um, I guess, the irreducibles of G here and irreducibles of H, more or less same size. So Let's say there is the uh, tempered dual is here. It sits inside, let's say, tempered guys. I'm going to put the T on the other hand side for, I don't know why. So let's say this, a certain part. So let's say this part is mapped via the how duality onto this part here. What we know uh, is that temperedness, so this tempered bit goes to the tempered bit here. So temperedness is preserved. So I'm going to call this the tempered local theta correspondence or tempered duality, maybe for short, tempered duality. So the result says that uh, there is actually a C-star correspondence such that when you look at the induction functor associated to this uh, C-star correspondence, it precisely captures the this bijection. Uh, so, so what we do is we essentially take the uh, space of the smooth oscillator representation is some kind of short space. And then we take a matrix coefficients in the style of the Heisenberg module of RIFO. Um, well, that was operating in the Heisenberg representation, but uh, the mechanism is the same. So I have here uh, uh, H value. And uh, so, so the big important, of course, point here is that 
in the equal rank case, the matrix coefficients are living the Schwartz, Harish Chandra Schwartz uh, algebras of the, the respective groups. So very fast decay on the matrix coefficients and on because the situation is symmetric on, on two sides. So I take these uh, matrix coefficients uh, as the and they live in the Schwartz spaces, which are of course uh, dense. Oh, this should be H. So they they sit inside the reduced group sister algebras on the two sides, and, I, and then you do a completion. So I have this uh, essentially bimodule, and uh, at this point I'm not going for an equivalence bimodule yet. Uh, so I have this bimodule, let's say over over one of them, uh, C star of reduced H. And using the representation from the left hand side, I have a C star representation of the reduced guy into a jointable bounded operators of this uh, Hilbert module. So that's a C star correspondence. And if you look at, let me call this guy X. I'm sorry, I'm being messy. I'm, I can't help. I get messy always. But uh, so if you, if you now look at the induction functor, say, say you take a, a nice, uh, Tempered irreducible representation of H, and then you send it. You do the refill induction with the uh, and send it to the other side. Now this is a G representation, tempered, because uh, our group here is this one is acting on the left reduced group system algebra. So the result is that this is nothing but the uh, essentially this uh, the Theta lift of phi contra gradient. So I have to put contra gradient on one of the sides. So this is what we mean by uh, the induction functor associated with this uh, bi module captures the theta lifting. So it sends pi star, the contra gradient of pi, to theta of pi. So, by the way, I didn't introduce notation, but typically uh, this pi ejection is denoted with that little theta. Right. So this this is. So of course this this says that uh, if you look at um, uh, so this is a functor this this is not just a bijection it's a sort of functor from um, uh, this functor uh, going from certain subcategory of temporal representations of H to that of G and so it has the nice features uh, of continuity for example um, respects uh, continuous with respect to weak inclusion. Uh, all the beautiful things that Morita Ekulms uh, sister uh, Ekulms biomodules provide us, and for example, uh, apparently this is this was not known. It doesn't follow from formal. Uh, Roger Hall actually asked me when I approached him a year ago. Um, I have this idea and stuff, so he said well, maybe you can look at the continuity of the of the theta uh, lifting. Um, apparently, it's it's, it's not uh, known. Um, doesn't follow from general consideration. So this comes for free for as once you know that it's, uh, I mean, of course, this is, I'm, I'm sticking to tempered parts here. Um, I'm not in the general admissible category, but uh, it has uh, gained some extra information. And you can actually now, I want to go further, of course, to an equivalence biomodule is the question that you want to go after. And for that, I need to use some more, uh, I mean, even this actually uses some refined information from the coming from representation theory of the oscillator representation. Positivity of these inner products of the H. Positivity comes from uh, so, so called certain uh, doubling zeta integrals. Um, doubling zeta integrals. Uh, so these are certain constructions go back to uh, Pietetsky, Shapiro, and Rallis. Pietetsky, Shapiro, and Rallis. Um, they attach certain uh, zeta integrals and L functions to these uh, local representations. But uh, so there is a, lo a lot of theory uh, that's already used. I mean, it's standard in the in in this in this area. But uh, we use that to show positivity. Of course, positive. You have to do something to show positivity. And uh, to go to an Ekulis bimodule, you we have to use even more results. Uh, so we stick to because we rely on a certain. Uh, highly non-trivial results in the literature. We have to assume their hypothesis. So uh, the key name really might go to person is Vitek Gunn here. Uh, he's a well-known expert in theory, and I'm using a lot of his results, especially for the second part. So if I'm going to stick to F non-Archimedean now, and and also stick to orthosymplectic pairs or maybe unitary pairs. 
And then we can actually promote this uh, C star correspondence to a, 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 a Coulomb's um, bimodule. So this, this uh, Schwartz space completed. Uh, you look at the ideal generated by the inner products. They generate some ideals. In general, these are not a full uh, Hilbert module. So you get some ideals sitting inside the uh, reduced group C-star algebras determined by the these inner products. And the key, of course, here is the compatibility. Um, so to get the compatibility of the inner products, um, right, so this is uh, Z here. Um, this is always, you know, the non-trivial bit is to do this compatibility so that the compacts, they're each other's compacts. Um, sorry, uh, YZ here. For example, for Heisenberg modules, uh, in, in Riffle use, uh, um, well, sorry, uh, Mark Riffle. So, so Riffle uses, uh, it boils down to, um, well, he uses lattices sitting inside the Heisenberg group or, or the symplectic space. And this is some kind of a, a Poisson transformation uh, to prove this. But in, in our case, it there is a, it boils down to a result of Kana and Chino. And actually it's very interesting that they, it gives uh, this on, on the nose, a uh, certain uh, local version of a uh, local uh, local version of uh, Rallis inner product formula. Again, Rallis inner product formula is quite well known in the theory. It's a global result. It's a local version of that local in inner product formula. Because I mean, you get some uh, integral over H on the other side, integral over G on the other hand side, some kind of matrix coefficients and stuff. And so it's kind of apples and oranges. But uh, it turns out that they give intertwiners in a same kind of space and that space is one dimension, the one dimensional. So they become each other's uh, multiples and stuff. So it's quite a very neat uh, how that result really gave us what we needed to prove uh, this compatibility of the inner products. So uh, so we have these two ideals. Obviously these ideals, uh, the, the, uh, the spectrum of this ideal is precisely the tempered representations of G that enter the theta correspondence. And the spectrum of the other one is precisely that for H. Because we are really looking at the tempered at, uh, oh, so this is H, tempered uh, bijection here. Right, so this is, this is uh, for the um, equal rank and for the, uh, we have this, similar results for the stable range, although the the flavor of the stable range is quite different, it turns out. The representation is more, uh, so the situation is not uh, symmetric here, and unitarity is preserved, so we try to do the same thing with maximal group C algebras naturally. And the uh, the bimodule, so we, we take it over uh, the small group always, uh, the, the point is that the an oscillator representation restricted to a small group essentially comes from a free and proper action on a certain space, free and proper action. Essentially, there, there is a certain dense subspace uh, on, upon which H acts, acts uh, freely and properly. So it, then it becomes a quite a usual NCG flavored, you know, we know how to deal with uh, cook up Hilbert modules from free proper actions of groups on spaces and so on. So that that, um, that becomes quite natural. But anyway, so we have this again bimodule for the maximal group C star algebras. Again, that captures the oscillator representation and for unitary uh, guys that entered oscillator representation, oscillator uh, theta correspondence, sorry. So we have the same result. Uh, and again, with uh, with extra work using uh, turns out to be the same hypothesis, but it's sticking to non-Archimedean and the orthogonal unitary guys. So it turns out that there is a big, you know, like you know, I guess it's well known, right? The representation theory. If you're working with Archimedean or Piedic, it's quite different worlds. People usually stick to one, and uh, we take gun sticks to non-Archimedean. So I'm using his results. So. Uh, I go with non archimedean as well. But actually, I, there's also a result of Tomasz Prebinda that I'm using, a student, another student of Roger Howe. So I won't make this too, too far, but yeah, we, we again use some uh, 
quite uh, so we use for example the theory of uh, degenerate principal series representations and so on to get the um the coolness bi module here so here the situation is a little less uh, uh less ideal in the sense that we have we don't have a nice uh, inner product for the left hand side what we do is that we show that there is the natural representation on the uh the hilbert module here it surjects onto the compacts we use the Tomas uh, Shevinda's results here. It's surjection under the comp. Uh, it goes into the compacts, and then we also search uh, that it gets all of the compacts um, using an, another result of, uh, an, again, a Gan Ichino type of result. Uh, yeah, so so this is how we, so we show that uh, there is, so there's a surjection from the left-hand side onto the compacts of the bimodule so that a quotient of the left-hand side is uh, the compact, hence it's more equivalent to the C star H. Here, the bimodule is full on C star H, which is compatible with the fact that all of the unitary dual of H enters the correspondence. And on the left-hand side, we get a quotient. It is highly probable that this this, this kernel is complemented, so that this is actually an ideal as well, this complemented ideal. So it's the, the set is open-closed on, on the unitary dual, but uh, we don't quite know that, right? So um, yeah, so this is this is the flavor. This is what the results look like. Um, there's an induction by there's a bi module uh, such that the induction functor associated to it really captures the unitary or the tempered uh, bijection. And and a um, couple of minutes left, maybe I can mention some uh, results. I mean. Um, these results are kind of really low-hanging fruits that uh, that I just saw. That this is, you know, you can, of course, the Morita equals the equals bi module allows you to transfer a lot of information between the C star algebras, especially transfer of uh, uh, traces and characters, stuff like that. That again go to uh, Riffle's results. That some very easy uh, deductions give you some interesting representation theoretic results. Uh, for example, let me give you one. Um, I'm going to look at theta, uh, let's say you have a pi and it's uh, corresponding theta pi on the other hand side. And uh, let's say we are in the equal rank case, and I'm going to stick to tempered guys. And of course, we are interested in the the Harishan, the, the distribution, the characters of this representation. So let me recall you the definition. So if you have a tempered irreducible representation of, let's say, nice uh, Lie group, then Harishanta introduced this, this character theory extended to tempered representations. What is it? It's a distribution on the Harishanta Schwartz algebra of the uh, group. It's a functional, it's a, it's a distribution. So, uh, what basically is happening is that uh, because it's tempered, if you, if you have a, a Schwartz function uh, uh, Harish, yeah, on, on the group, the representation will extend to it. Uh, you can integrate it. So this is going to be convergent um, because it's a Schwartz function. So and it's a tempered representation. Uh, so what am I going to say here? Phi s, phi phi s, I guess d d s. Right. So uh, and some people can even say that this is definition of maybe temperedness if if it integrates to the Schwartz algebra. But anyway, so this uh, this because the Schwartz function, this operator here, this operator on um, b h i is trace class. So you can talk about this trace in a, in a safe manner. And so this is the so-called character of the tempered representation. It's a distribution on the Schwartz algebra. And what we have is that, so our, you know, in the equal rank, the bimodule, uh, remember it, it's, so we have the bimodule and the inner products land in the Schwartz algebras, which are dense in the reduced groups sister algebras. So through a very simple-minded, uh, you know, you, you can when you whenever you have this pi module, you can actually have these uh, representations on 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 these uh, intertwiner spaces like this. Um, X goes to I don't know. Uh, maybe this is, let's say t. X goes to what? Uh, v goes to x tensor v. Um, so of course here we this is the uh, induction when you apply the induction functor. 
So there are these kind of uh, uh, concrete representations of your bimodules on the space of intertwiners, and, and you can just simply use this, uh, this representation to show that if you fix two Schwartz functions, uh, so these are the Schwartz functions on, on uh, affording the uh, underlying your bimodule, equivalence bimodule. So if you take x, y, and if you take the uh, matrix G matrix coefficient living in S, G, and take x, y uh, with the H matrix coefficient living in the Schwartz algebra of the other group, um, you have this identity that uh, the, the character of pi evaluated at this Schwartz uh, function, this is a group Schwartz, uh, Harishander Schwartz element, is going to be equal to the uh, trace, uh, sorry, the character of uh, the theta of pi applied to x, y, you switch y, x, y, x, y uh, on the other Schwartz algebra. And this is a very explicit way of uh, transfer of characters. And this is something that representation theorists uh, care about. And it turns out actually this is, um, VTEC Gun actually did has the same result. <laughs> it looks um, announced in talks. So he didn't publish it in the in the last two years. And and it uh, Tomas Pshebinda, I guess, has a lot of work in the transfer of characters uh, in the stable range cases. Uh, but uh, the point is that I guess this is really half a page. Uh, comes from a very well known uh, basic concrete representation of your bi equals bimodulous intertwiners. So this is actually, this is something like T, T, X, Y star, and this is uh, T, Y star, uh, T, something. Yeah, so it's a very simple, simple result. And uh, you could also do even more, uh, maybe some K-theoretic stuff uh, related to formal degrees. Um, you know, in the, in the, again, in the equal rank case, you have the essentially, um, it's well known that the discrete series go to discrete series. So if you look at the K theory of the group sister algebras, reduced, I guess, the equivalence bimodule, of course, gives you an isomorphism between the K groups. And whenever you have discrete series, as is well known, they give you generators. And, um, and the canonical trace evaluation at identity, which is well defined for the reduced group sister algebra, uh, picks up formal degrees, as is well known. Do I have a notation for the formal degree? Yeah, it's just... Well, I mean, there is some, of course, it depends on the Haar measure chosen, fixed, and stuff, but yeah. So, and so what you can do is you can, of course, there's a well known result going back to Riefel, I guess, again. Uh, you can take these uh, more. Equivalent, more equivalent algebras as corners in the linking algebra, and then extend your trace to the linking algebra, and then press it down to the other corner, and uh, you can pull this trace back. And it turns out that we show that you know um, it's quite elementary stuff, but uh, if you pull this trace back, the trace you get here is uh, let me call this trace H, the canonical trace of G. So that's what you get. So that uh, and the class that you get is the class of the discrete series that the, this pi goes to. So I, here I'm using that discrete series go to discrete series. But I, um, there is a little bit more because, you know, we work with ideals here, not the full, but th that's essentially a very simple minded mechanism that, you know, traces, you can detect traces, uh, using traces, you can detect for formal degrees of discrete series as generators of K-theory and so on. So it's, again, this is a, a well-known result of Gan and Ichino. I'm going basically reproving known results, but uh, so that's actually because, you know, I'm not a representation theorist. So I looked at, you know, what can we do with this? And okay, there are these kind of results, so it follows very easily. So I just, and, but it's interesting that, you know, use K-theory to uh, some traces to get these things. And of course you could use uh, different trace. Uh, this is the trace at identity, right? So that's the kind of the orbital integral for the conjugate class of the uh, trivial element, but in general you can, use other orbits so that the, the orbital integrals other conjugacy classes and the orbital integrals give you traces. So you could also transfer those things and so on. You could get, I don't know, maybe you could, if you could do something with the, uh, you know, there is, so these kind of traces usually detect things only about discrete series. You can't go beyond the principal series classes and stuff are usually non-detectable with these kind of traces. But uh, I know that Shang and uh, Yandi have some, 
uh, I guess, uh, CV cohomology classes that go beyond those classes. I don't know if anything can be done with those with the column spy module. But yeah, anyway, so that's, I'm going to stop here. I think slightly over time. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any questions for Haluk? Uh, Jonathan, yeah, there's so many clapping hands. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks. Uh, this was really beautiful talk. Uh, very, very nice. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Uh, here's one. Um, if you go back to, um, I guess, in terms of the numbering system in the lower right, uh, slide 15, I think. Um, More? Uh, 15, next one, right, yeah. So, um, uh, let's see, you have this uh, C star correspondence, um, and you said if you take a tempered representation of, of G and you apply the correspondence, you get the um you get the thing on the other side i'm assuming here that if your x is not in the set of things that uh that have a theta lift then you just get something that's identically zero is that right yes that's right that's right um yes uh because this is um the the module by module is not full the the inner products cut out an ideal only okay i just wanted to make sure I yes indeed that's on. right okay yeah Very it's true. Um, I guess the other question was um, whether, I mean, the main use of the theta correspondence is to get um, lifts of uh, automorphic forms like the Shimura correspondence. Um, and I was just wondering what you might be able to do along those lines. Uh, yeah, so there's actually, um, my motivations are also global. Um, I'm not really a local representation theory kind. I mean, of course, you have to do a lot of local things, uh, but you can uh, approach it. I guess there are two ways you can work with the global case. Um, maybe I can, oh, sorry. Um, I'll just try to move to the side a little bit. It's, um, it's an infinite canvas. So uh, you can work identically as a, Automorphic representation. So, though you would. Right. Uh, I would imagine a lot of this probably goes through in the Adela case as well. Yeah. So, the identity construction uh, works actually quite similarly. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can actually cook up. So, I, I did look at it and it seemed to work um, uh, that you can cook up the. Yeah. So, the, you take the Adelic vector space and. Um, and um, Right, uh, so Schwartz, Adelic Schwartz function, which is a really restricted product of sh local Schwartz spaces, mm -hmm. and uh, you can take the Adelic group. Um, the, the what you have to do this, I guess, the bimodule you're gonna the, put here, not the full sister algebra of the Adelic group. This is still a nice locally compact group, so this is all good. Um, but uh, you're going to want to represent this in in the bounded operators on the cuspidal part of the L two space right. on yes. the caution GQ. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the image of that, uh, whatever is the image, and uh, using that, I can I can capture the global uh, correspondence. What would be, I actually my my main uh, motivation for this project was the to get a. a uh, Langlands functoriality for uh, it's kind of Jackie Langlands correspondence, mm -hmm. um, a, a kind of a, a cohomological version. Uh, it would it would take a kind of I think it's too long to explain here, uh, but uh, I want to do a K theoretic version of. Uh, so it's well known that the Jackie Langlands correspondence can be captured by theta correspondence. Um, in general, theta correspondence is. Uh, not really uh, functorial in the sense of Langlands with the L groups and stuff. Only it becomes functorial when the groups are essentially mostly equal size. And um, in this case, the Jacques Langlands correspondence can be captured by theta correspondence with the pair you, you take uh, SL2 and uh, SO of the quaternion algebra. Um, right. Yeah. Quaternion algebra. And um, but I want to do yeah, I want to do the K theoretic version of this and um 
the the approach through the uh, adelic groups they don't seem to help me so i that's why I, I want to do it kind of more classically and the classical way of this i mean of course adelic is the right way to go but the classical way you would have to introduce a lattice in, sitting mm -hmm. inside your uh, space and then you have the theta uh functional on your um on your Schwartz space where each Schwartz function is now summed over the lattice. And this converges because the Schwartz function, it, this sum converges. And uh, yeah, so what you done, yeah, anyways, it's too long. The sh yeah, uh, the short answer is that, yeah, I'm actually, this is my main project is to do something global. And uh, Adelic version doesn't seem to quite help me unless, uh, one option is to maybe do something local global compatibility using Hilbert modules, which doesn't seem to be in literature, but might be something uh, might it could be done perhaps. I don't know. Um, but I want to do, I guess, go along more classical lines uh, that introduce a lattice. And then you have two arithmetic groups on two sides that fix to stabilize the lattice. So it's roughly speaking and gamma prime. And I'm, I want something relating their reduced group C star algebras of the two arithmetic groups. I want to go really in this. And I, what I really want is something actually, so I want the group on the left to act by compact operator so that my bi module is a KK cycle so that it gives me a map. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the part that's proving a little bit difficult. Uh, yeah, so this is what I want to go for, but that's, that's really, yeah, uh, global, aspect is really what I'm aiming for and I want something K theoretic uh, that's the part that's proving a little difficult but yeah um, indeed my motivations are indeed quite global actually yeah okay great that sounds very interesting yeah. other questions I have another uh, question about page 15 the same equal Ooh. case uh, actually two questions first of all if you if you work with non-Archimedean fields. Is it necessary to complete S of U? I mean, is there an algebraic Morita equivalence by Is it an algebraic Morita equivalence by module between two ideals in the Heck algebras? That's a good question. Um, because there there is a, at least in the stable range case, the it's kind of a similar construction, um, this, this refill induction, uh, functor um, here, this one. Uh, Tomas Prebinda, so oh, Shebinda, I think that's how you say it. Um, so this, as I said, this goes back to Jian Shu Li in his thesis in 19, 18, 1989. He essentially gave this construction and without, of course, using any sister algebra ideas. Or, so it's very interesting that he explicitly constructed this, uh, which is the same as the threefold induction. But then, uh, so he was sticking to unitary things. But Shebinda then showed that almost the same construction what, uh, can be applied in the whole admissible uh, category. And that made me feel like, okay, maybe, because I mean, this, this, this balanced tensor product is an algebraic thing. It can be done in you know, bigger for beyond these star algebras. Maybe there is something there. And that's exactly what you're asking. Don't know. Um, in the non archimedean case, I think it's non archimedean it's had a case. chance of success. Then. Mm -hmm. Don't know. So, but like, so the matrix coefficients live in the. How do I relate the matrix coefficients with the Heck algebra? Um, I guess the matrix. Okay, the Heck algebra is just. Well, you don't need in the functions. products anymore. You, do, you just need the bimodule structure, which is automatic. So, there's yeah. a chance. Okay, I guess I'm. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I was sticking most to standard literature with the sister sister algebras, but um, I'll, I'll definitely think about this because I there might be a because this construction balanced tensor balanced tensor product construction seems to go in the admissible to the admissible spills over to the admissible bijection, and I didn't know what rings to put on the two sides for that. <laughs> So, okay, I'll, I'll think about this. Thank you, Nigel. Um, make algebra maybe for the classical. Yeah. On, on, on I, I have one other quick question, uh, which is related to, to Jonathan's question. You, you construct ideals in C star of G and C star of H. Uh, inside of those C star algebras, there are other ideals, namely the kernels of the representations on 
uh, L2 and V, L2 of you. Um, mm -hmm. it, I guess it's too much to hope that these two ideals are complementary inside of C star G, C star reduced to G. Is it? <laughs> In other words, is this collection of representations both open and closed? Um... No. How would that have, uh, would that give us an advantage or something? Um, um, well, if it, I don't know. If it, if the whole C star algebra fell apart conveniently into two pieces, two, uh, you know, commuting ideal, um, and not mutually annihilating ideals, that would be quite striking. Hmm. But I, mean, I, I don't know. I just, I guess that examples that amounts to saying that the part of the tempered tool that enters the theta correspondence open and closed, right? Yes, That's correct. This could be true. I mean, I think uh, in the stable range case, uh, Roger Howe, yeah, so Roger Howe is quite interesting, actually. So he has a kind of a harmonic analysis background, so he does a lot of semi-simple representation theory, which kind of stands along with general harmonic analysis, kind of different techniques, but he has a, a kind of an eye for general harmonic analysis. So he actually, in a old paper in the stable range case he shows that the images are coming from a small group sitting inside the unitary tool of the big group they're open closed at least when you fix the, there's a notion of rank he introduces i think there is room for this being true um but yeah i have i haven't thought about it uh interesting but, uh, uh, anyway yes I, uh, for, for the questions if not, then uh, let's uh, thank Halep one more time. Get the 